and then I push this green button right there. And by pushing that green button, that means that we are now live on Facebook. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. This is David Dorian Ross, and it says the connection was, was severed to the Flash server. Why? Why? Why would you do that? Um, but the green light's still on, so I'm going to assume that we're still on. Uh, so let's try this again. Hi, everybody. It's David Dorian Ross, and you are hanging out live with me and my good friend, Dr. Tammy McCracken. And I have to say she's my good friend, otherwise she'll beat me up. Because um, as I've been saying, I don't know if you knew this, but I put the, out onto the internet that you are the most dangerous therapist on the planet. <laughs> So if you're looking for a chance to meet the most dangerous therapist on the planet, you've come to the right place. And I uh, just want to say welcome. And I'm hoping that uh, you'll join us for the next hour or so, uh, getting to know uh, each other and um, I'm inviting you guys to be part of the conversation, you meaning Facebook. Ask some questions. I'm going to check out and see if I can find us here on, uh, on Facebook. So give me a second here as this refreshes. And in the meantime, let me introduce Dr. Tammy McCracken, who I met um, uh, this year. Uh, I actually started late last year, didn't we? Almost this time yeah, last yeah. year. We met, because we met like this, we met in Zoom, in preparation for a project that we worked on together for the great courses called the Martial Arts for Mind and Body. And I had the just extreme delight and privilege to meet all these different experts that we brought in for the martial arts program. And, and Tammy came in to um, introduce us and cover the subject of Krav Maga. And she is the head of the women's division of Krav Maga Global. And um, an incredibly um, diverse person. And I just, like, I'm so delighted that you're here. So Tammy, thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me. This is this will be fun. Um, so I'm gonna let, for first of all, let me just check one more time, see if I can find us. There we are. We're live on Facebook. We're famous. It's a, awesome. So uh, now that I have found the um, the page that we're on, uh, it also gives me Walter is here. So I'm I'm seeing already that some of the people who are visiting and and watching. Um, Paul is here. Matt Jeffs is also here. So guys, uh, you know the drill. Um, you are welcome to type in your questions for, for Tammy. I'm going to get her talking here for a second, but I'm going to be checking on this to um, feed her some of the questions that you've got. Uh, so don't be shy. Type in like that. So why don't we get started like this? Uh, like there's a whole lot of background I don't know about you. Uh, tell us your life story in three minutes or less. <laughs> Let's start with something simple. Oh, yeah, um, I just thought I'd go there. Yeah. Um, uh, I work backwards. I'm 53 years old. Um, and uh, a short version um, I grew up kind of uh, displaying the difference between living kind of in the suburb city and living out on. Um, kind of the foothills of the Ozark Mountains in Missouri. So I spent a lot of time tromping through the woods and stuff like that. And then fast forward, undergrad degree is in education and then, you know, advanced degrees in psychology and counseling. Um, from a martial arts training standpoint, a little bit of Taekwondo, a little bit of Tai Chi, and, uh, and then got into Krav Maga and self-defense and um, married. Uh, for uh, a little over 30 years, two kids, um, one gone, married one off recently. And oh, wow. uh, about to look, did, yeah, did uh, that just and, happened in this, July. since I saw you. Uh, yes. Yeah. In July. Congratulations there. Yeah. Thank you. We had a wedding in July. Very exciting. Um, and then I had, uh, and then the, the youngest one, we are about to. Sorry, I have all kinds of things trying to vibrate here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the youngest one will be graduating from high school this year. Um, live in the D.C. metro area of Virginia side of the house. Um, all right, so how'd I do with the three minutes or less on the life story? That was, that was pretty good. That was, that was pretty good in short there. So, but I'm going to go back then to Missouri. Um, so that's where you're from originally? It is. And did you live, you say you lived in the suburbs. Um, so what was, 
what, what kind of kid were you? Were you, uh, were you an, a, an athlete? Were you uh, a nerd? What were you, what were you like? Um, I, I wasn't really an athlete growing up. You know, if you, we go back in time, that time frame, um, late sixties, early seventies, there were, actually weren't a ton of athletic opportunities for girls at, at that point. Um, so from an athletic standpoint, uh, I did a lot of hunter and jumper horseback riding, um, water sports, stuff like that, but nothing formal or official. And I was, uh, kind of a classic youngest child in the sense that I was, I was the one walking through the woods with a stick going, oh, look, there's a hole, what's in there? Um, and, and not particularly quick at learning the lessons about why one should not do that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and other things. In Missouri, that's what comes out, of it. right? Yes, and, and other creatures. Um, you know, I was the one to go, oh, look, big cat paw print, let's follow it. Uh, instead of going, hmm, maybe stay away. So, um, and so I, I tended to be that one. Um, and as a result, uh, lear learned a lot of really valuable lessons, usually the hard way. And um, yeah. So when you were tromping through the woods and, and growing up, what did you imagine that you wanted to be when you grew up? So, uh, yeah, so I had a very broad range of interests growing up. It depended on which day you asked, right? Like uh -huh. most kids. And um, I wanted to be an exotic animal veterinarian. That was probably the longest running kid goal um, until I discovered how much math and science I was gonna have to have. And then promptly did a 180 mm -hmm. and went. Um, and then let's see what else when I was little. Um, I wanted to be a priest, not realizing that gender wise that was gonna be a problem. You'd have to be Episcopalian, and, right? So. Uh, Yes. Yeah. yeah. And half of my family is Irish Catholic. So I was thinking oh, that line. Yeah. Yeah. My dad was like, yeah. So about that, um, you're the, the, you're, you're made wrong for that role. And so then when I, I ditched the priest thing, I'm like, okay, I'll be a witch. How about let's do that. So get the best of both worlds. You could be the, you know, <laughs> yes. Um, there's the, altars I, involved, you know, so yeah. Right. Exactly. And I think, so, you know, growing up a little bit when I realized the whole math and science thing was not something that was really my forte, then 180 over to wanting to go into actually theater arts. And um, my parents who are pretty, pretty smart people said, well, you know what, that's fantastic if you want to do that. And the reality of making money on that is you know, about like that big. So have at it but you're going to learn how to struggle early and you get to pay for your own college education and at you know 17 that didn't sound like a fantastic idea either <laughs> so, um, and then i found education specifically uh, i majored in education the deaf and hard of hearing and i actually fell in love with that so um that's where those random childhood paths um, ended up for a while so, um, gosh, 20 questions just popped into my head. Um, do you, uh, at your, in, in your family, uh, with your husband and your two kids, do you guys have pets? We do. What kind of pets do you have? At present, we have uh, just a dog and a cat. That's the, we've had many more of those at different times. So that's, so, and, yeah, that's, I'm going to follow up on this. So that's at present, but what are some of the other ones that you've had? Other dogs um, and cats or? Other dogs and cats we've had, of course, with the boys, we've had, you know, guinea pigs and chinchillas and various other sort of small caged animals. Um, and then we lived out actually for a period of time in our married life. We, we lived for about 25 years in Texas outside of Houston hmm. and had some land. And so we had a plethora of horses for a while. And um, that's it. I wanted chickens. My husband wasn't a fan of the yard birds, so I didn't get chicken. <laughs> so the reason why I ask that question is I'm always fascinated by um, observing how our childhood imaginings of who we are and how, you know, what we want to be. We all say, what do you want to be when you grow up kind of thing? And then it's like, well, I never was, uh, you know, a brain surgeon 
Um, but uh, now I make, uh, you know, models of, uh, you know, RP make art pieces of, of people's bodies and anatomy. Like those, I've just made that up off the top of my head, by the way. Um, but so it's interesting to say you said you wanted to be an exotic animal veterinarian, but that didn't like that didn't, didn't happen. It's like, yeah, it did. You had <laughs> a zillion pets and dogs, and and of course a chinchilla, which every family has in their house, right? Of course. We all raise chinchillas. Um, well, wonderful. Thank you for uh, for sharing that. Okay, so those of you who are watching on Facebook who don't quite know how the hangouts work. I ask uh, Tammy and our guests a few questions, and then it's their turn. So uh, you get to ask me a question now. And then we have some questions yeah. from um, the people on, who are watching on Facebook. And by the way, just I don't know if you know, but I, um, here on Facebook, I just put a, a scroll that goes across the bottom of the screen that says, if you've got a question for uh, Dr. McCracken or myself, um, just go ahead and type it into the comment section back there. That's what I'm doing when I look down here. I'm checking out to see what your questions are. So we'll, we'll feed it to her so so I have the same question then because you know this is not a, a conversation you and I have had together before um, what did you want to be when you were little so that's really interesting so um, in I think early on I wanted to be a writer I wanted to to write books and and publish books uh, and um, and also sort of be on stage. My father was a professional actor and, and dancer and then um, a teacher. So he, he um, transitioned from the theater into the classroom. Um, and I got a chance to be around all that. And I said, that's just awesome. I want to be like that. But I um, then quickly found some other kinds of interest. And in a, at some point, it also for me sort of translated into wanting to be a priest. I think in an in another life, in an alternate universe, that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm 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 the I'm the stand-up comic priest. Uh, so I'm the guy who uh, can can not the fire and brimstone, but like you know the Chris Rock of of religion kind of thing. <laughs> that's fantastic. <laughs> and I get and and again, I believe that's it. Kind of hit home for me in a way. And this sounds really terrible, especially if, if any of the people who are watching are religious and have a passion for their own personal religion. Um, so when I moved to Hawaii many years ago, I moved there from Oregon with the intention of not teaching Tai Chi anymore. Like I, I had just closed a big school and I wanted to just be a beach bum and surf and just do nothing. And I wasn't really telling anybody that I taught Tai Chi and then my circle of new friends found out and they were like, oh, you do Tai Chi, oh my God, you have to have a class. And so I said, all right, I will teach a class on the condition that it's on Sunday mornings at nine o'clock because I figured nobody would show up. Everybody's in church. Like, like it, was, it was a guarantee that it would fail and then I could say, no, see, I'm not teaching Tai Chi anymore. Unfortunately, that morning, about 50 people, including the local television station, showed up for my very first class. And I wow. had this epiphany. It's like, okay, these are not people who are tied to a particular religion. This is their church. They want to come. To, yeah. And so, like, when you speak to these people, they're, they're here to seek a sort of a spiritual communal, community, but not in the way that has a religious name on it. So I got to do it. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. Very cool. So um, we have a question. Uh, I think this might be actually my student, Judy. Uh, but she's logged in a, as me as Tai Chi Fit International. She says, um, about martial arts, she says, what is the biggest fear that people have when they start the martial arts? Oh, that's a really good question. Isn't that a good um, question? I like that yeah. question. Um, trying to be super generalized here, in my experience, it would be that they're not going to be able to do it. You know, that, that I'm going to get into this and um, I'm going to suck, <laughs> basically. And that it's, um, you know, and, and I think the fear it changes so much based on who you are. Like, so if you're 18, I think mm. it's a little bit less of a concern of I'm not going to be able to do it than if you're 40. And I think that the fears change a little bit between men and women as well. Um, but I think that's, 
what, what I see on my mat, it, that's the dominant question from both the men and the women is, you know, what, what if I'm really bad? <laughs> so is that the same? Because I'm thinking that it might not be, but I want to know your response. Is that the same as a fear of getting hurt? Uh, I, you know, I think that maybe that's tucked into it because that question comes up as well. It comes up a, a separately, you know, as people are asking questions, mm -hmm. you know, and they come in for the intro and there, those questions pop up. Sometimes they're direct, like, you know, am I going to get hit? Am I going to get my nose broken? Am I going to get, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, some, but usually it's a little bit more indirect as far as the questions come up, like how much contact do you make? Mm -hmm. You know, and that's really a, am I going to get hurt question. So I think it's tucked in there for, for a good number of people. What's your experience with that? So that's a very interesting question um, to feed back to me. Let me, I just want to make one comment uh, about Krav Maga specifically, because I've been, by the way, I wore my Krav t-shirt here. Uh, that. Just so that you, um, so having gone to uh, Krav classes, I can tell you from other martial arts training and comparison and boxing and comparison, Tai Chi and comparison, I've never been hit in the nose, uh, like not with Krav Maga. I've been hit in the nose quite often, as you probably can tell, but I um, have never been hit in the nose in Krav Maga. I've never really been hit in the head, uh, like we, we sort of make sure that there's contact there, but I've never been like hit or punched. However, every single class, I get kicked in the groin every single <laughs> class, which now everybody's like, <gasps> so I'm going to have Tammy talk about that in a minute, here. <laughs> just so that we can set the record straight. Um, so it's interesting that people come and, and I think Tai Chi has a bit of a different context for, for people. They, they think of it slightly differently than some of the other martial arts, but they come already with a series of caveats like okay now you know I'm not very flexible or I'd like to do Tai Chi but I, I have no balance or you know like I'm not very like they already have all the reasons why they're going to be bad at it so yeah. it's not even a question it's not even like I have a biggest fear it's like no I already know just so that we are clear that I suck and you know I suck and we both know that I suck right so it's it, then one of the first things that we we try to well, one of the principles that we have operating in Tai Chi Fit is I don't care. Like, I don't care. Like, so you're not flexible. I don't care. That's just like your breathing. Yeah. That's a good thing. <laughs> you, you have an interest. That's a good thing. Like, that's as far as it goes. I'm just, I'm so delighted to make your, make your acquaintance. And that's all I care about. Yep. Agreed. Um, and that's, you know, the, the, one of the big things that we try to tell prospective students here, and even our people who have been on the map for a little while is, look, you, you do you. Mm. This is, this is the, the body that you walk around in every day is the body that you live in. And we're gonna work with that body. And there are gonna be other people on the mat in class with you who are walking around inside of different bodies. And that's cool too. And just do you. And if you have a body part that just doesn't work well anymore, like hey, guess what? My ankle doesn't do that anymore because I have a pin in it or whatever. It's like, okay, cool. Let me know. Don't sit there and try to force it you know, right, during class. Right. The instructor said, and I'm trying to do that and my ankle's going, oh my God, you have to stop. You know, like, don't put yourself in that position, wave us down and go, hey, my ankle doesn't do that anymore. Okay, cool. Let's work around it. That's cool. Be you. Right. And, all, and, and the martial arts for me, and it's, again, I don't want to put words in, in our, my guest mouth, but we, we get into some of these stories. Like for me, uh, the entire point of the martial arts is a, a journey of self-discovery, right? And so you come and you have this idea, like, okay, I can't do this, I can't do that. It's like, so you're not really discovering anything. You like, you've, you've figured out that you've already like know where the end of the journey is. So my inner, um, hidden agenda is to trick you out of the door and onto a journey. And it's like six months later, you come back. Here's a, here's a classic example. So I had a woman uh, back when I lived in Hawaii 
uh, who, who came to class one day and she said, you know, she let me know that she was in her 80s, sort of her late 80s. And she says, you know, I, I can't stand up the whole class like everybody else does because we're outside in the park. She says, I can't stand up. She says, is it okay if I bring my lawn chair and then I can just sit down? I'm like, yeah, bring your lawn chair, you know. Barbara, I think her name was. So I said, Barbara, bring your lawn chair. So like six months later, you know, she came to me one day and she goes, I just want you to know that I don't bring my lawn chair anymore. <laughs> like, like I, it, I, first I was standing up for 10 minutes and then 20 minutes and then I was like 45 minutes and now I don't even bring the lawn chair anymore. She says, but, you know, that, that kicks. And I said, what about the kicks? She goes, I just have problem doing that. <laughs> like, that? <laughs> the thing that you just did. The thing that you just did, exactly. Oh. That's that's fantastic, and and I think that's a great way to contextualize it. Is that it's it is a journey, and I, I, and you're right. A lot of people walk through the door, um, having already defined what is or what isn't, and and so the possibility of the journey is is not present. Um, and it, and it is. It's fun, you know, to watch somebody six months later go, you know, or, or just just watching them in class, you know, in the transition of who they were. And sometimes it's it's about once in a while kind of highlighting it for them. It's like, hey, you know, fantastic job. Right. You know, six months ago when you started. Right. Do you remember that, never, that whole thing you said about <laughs> I can't walk on chew gum at the same time? Yeah. Hmm. So we have a question um, from uh, Leslie Wade Radford, um, and she had sent me a message on Facebook earlier. Cause, so I think she was really waiting to um, come and, and meet you. So uh, you've got a fan already. Um, Hi, Leslie. And Leslie says, uh, how long have you been studying Krav Maga? Now, I, Leslie, I'm, I'm guessing that you're using that as an icebreaker to ask a bunch of other questions. So go ahead and, and type in some more questions after this. But she'll, she, she wants to know like how long you've been doing Krav. Um, so about six years, seven years, coming up on seven years which in the world of martial arts doesn't sound like very long. Um, when you get into people who've been like 20 years, 30 years um, to be sensei, it Krav is, um, I, say, I, don't, I don't know if your viewers know who Master Ken is. Yes, uh, yes. Okay, all right. So Master yes. Ken's fantastic. He's like, uh, Krav Maga is the GED of martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, for the, wait, 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 I got to contextualize it. Don't, don't lose that thought. So for those of you who don't know who Master Ken is, you can look him up on YouTube. Uh, sometimes he's got Facebook uh, posted. He is, he, like, I probably shouldn't say this to his face. He might try to hit me, but he's a martial arts comedian. And he has this, um, uh, Ameritaido is his style. And uh, he, he makes fun of everything that's possible to make fun of uh, in the martial arts. Um, and so uh, that's who Master that's who she's talking about. Just okay, there you go. Yeah, so Krav is the GED of martial arts. And it's it's really stinking funny because in a way it's kind of true in a sense that it's it's just it's, um, until you get into some of the more complex, more militaristic things that we do, it's not that tough to pick up. So yeah, about seven years. About seven years. And then and you said you had you had uh, a limited sort of exposure to martial arts before that, Taekwondo a little bit. And it, was there anything else that you had done martial arts? A wise? little bit, a little bit of Tai Chi. I did a little bit. I did Taekwondo for about 18 months, two years. Um, it was sort of the like um, mom thing. I, my oldest was uh -huh. doing, had been doing it for quite a while. And it was like, I'll do it with you, you know, cause he was kind of, I don't want to do it anymore. You know, so I was trying to keep it going. Um, so I did that for about two years. And then Tai Chi has been kind of an in and out thing with um, different people that I've run into who, who teach it. And I'm actually starting to get back into it again. Um, ran into, I know a guy here in the area, a gentleman who's um, been teaching for a good like 20 some odd years. And we tried to coordinate it so he could do some classes here at the gym and uh, the schedules just didn't work. So I'm just uh, starting with some private lessons. We just got started, in fact. So I'm super excited about that. That makes me so happy, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me see. We, are, we have a bunch of other uh, questions coming in. Now they're... Um... Okay, fine. I'm putting yeah. on my glasses. <laughs> 
<laughs> time to break down and do that. Okay, so this is really, uh, this is a really, really, this is a deep question. Are you ready? Like, the, okay, we're going to get into like the serious question here. Um, okay. As a therapist and as a martial artist, how does she handle aggression used as a defense mechanism? Like that's wow. a textbook question. That's like a, that's like a final exam question. Right? Oh yeah, that's a fantastic question. Like gold star to whoever that was who put those pieces together. Um, as a defense mechanism. So the, uh, it show when it show it show when it shows up on the mat, it, it's, it's a nuance. And so it, you know, mm -hmm. comes down to like on the instructor side, hopefully being able to read the difference um, between like the aggression that we're training for and when it's being used defensively. Mm -hmm. And it's, in my experience, I'm just, I'm recalling people and students. So um, when I see it show up as a defense mechanism, it's it, like all defense mechanisms, it's protective in nature. And it's about fear that I'm not, I'm not going to be accepted. I'm not, it comes back to a little bit of that good enough measure, um, a, that in deep internal struggle of who I am as a person being sufficient, just, just me, I'm sufficient. I I'm, I'm complete just as who I am. And there's no bar to measure up to, but when that's not, when that's in question, then the type of aggression displayed on the mat shifts a little bit. Mm -hmm. And, and so what our job is and what I coach my instructors to do is when you see that, it's like support the aggressive behavior because we're really working on developing that for a lot of people that's really challenging, mm -hmm. but come at it underneath. Like, you know, Hey, that was, if it's a technical thing um, and somebody, what, so a lot of times what we'll see, sorry, I'm going off on a tangent here is we'll see somebody working on a skill and they'll, they'll screw it up in, in their mind. They will have done something incorrect. And then that internal, uh, um, correction is okay. Well, I'll just I'll be more aggressive, and maybe I won't be as good of a nice of a training partner when my partner gets a go. Or you know, so we'll see that show up, and then it's about coming in and, and uh, coming back to hey, do you like so? If if it was a mistake, did you did you come out of it okay? Did you die? Are you bleeding? You know, are you conscious still? Like you didn't get knocked out? Fantastic, that's a win. And uh, so. That's a really good question because we let me see if I can let me let me change the 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 the, the scenario just slightly and see if we can okay. maybe tease some of this out because I can feel like I can feel where you're you're like almost there. So let's take it out of the mat. Let's take it off the mat into social situations or family situations and something like this. And so you have a unique kind of background. You have a dual background in the martial arts where you 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 witnessed this in. You know, a controlled setting, and you talk what you're just talking about. And you're also a therapist, and you you've got you've got education around the the origins of this kind of behavior. Like, but then you know, like real life happens, and you like somebody cuts you off in the parking lot, jumps out of their car. Like, you know, aggression as a defense mechanism, you know, or something like that. So, what do you what do you do, or how do you approach that? It's does that make it harder um, or does that make it easy? <laughs> uh, so general context, I'll do this from a, um, a general teaching context as a self-defense instructor sure. versus martial arts instructor per se. Yeah. It, that your, our aggression comes from a couple of different places as human beings. One is very raw and instinctive and it's just, just raw animalistic survival. And most people don't touch that because most people aren't don't confront that like life and death decision making moment mm. um at that raw of a level so the rest of the aggression comes out of our our, our need our tribal needs and our, our social engineering that we that we have or we don't have so when that kind of aggression pops up like somebody's cutting you off and you're Urk, um what what i ask people to do is think about this from a 
monkey brain perspective, which is our social primate side. And that essentially there are four problems that the monkey brain gets worked up over. And it's membership, territory, protocols, and, and membership, territory, always, you know, and I rattle them off, there's four, I always forget one and it's a different one every stinking time. Bananas. So stat, status, status, membership, territory, protocol. And status is my value in my tribe membership is that I belong to one um, and when I want to. And the protocols are the social rules that we live by or my tribe lives by. And then territory is both physical, like my office, your office, you know, mm -hmm. uh, my chair, your chair, but it's also ideological. Um, we'll, we'll go to war over territory and ide ideology. So driving, I get cut off. I'm instantly angry, frustrated, and I'm saying interesting things to the person who cut me off. And so look at that. And which, which four of those just got pained? because it's a breadcrumb trail. It's like, it's always right. one of the four, or, right. or sometimes it's like Legos, it's like two or three of the four that get activated. So aggression, when it just sort of pops out of us emotionally like that is go look at one of those four, which one of those got like stepped on, like it's your foot when somebody steps on your foot and you react to which one of those four, because that's a monkey problem and reacting to it from that tribal social primate brain is not going to create the solution that's really effective for us. So identifying that it's one of those four lets you move out of it. Oh, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. And it automatically um, alerts me to, we should have done this last week so that people could have used this information during Thanksgiving dinner. It just, yeah. Um, God, this is so awesome. I, w I wish we're going to have to do a, a part two of this. We have to do this again because okay. I can tell we're going to, we've got plenty of time, by the way, folks. We're, we're not going anywhere, but I can see this. Now we're starting to get more questions on uh, Facebook. And so um, here is one again from Leslie. So Leslie's got another one. Uh, she says, how is Krav organized as far as promotion or growth? Other martial arts use belts and ranks, students and teachers. How does it work with crop? Depends on the system. So there are a couple of different major organizations or systems in crop. I'm with Krav Maga Global and our system uses patches. So it's a little bit of a nod to the military context or the origins of the, of the system. And we're split into essentially three units of progression. So we have our practitioner levels and there's a P1 practitioner one through practitioner five. And there's a color, a specific color of patch. And as you progress, you get your next patch will have another stripe on it. So P1 is a uh, sort of a tan brown patch with a P in the middle and one stripe. You get to P5, there are five stripes. And, and each unit is broken up into, um, into those five. So we have practitioner levels, our graduate levels, and there are five of those, and then our expert levels, and there are five of those. So it goes from P for practitioner and G for graduate. Is that right? Is that, yes. is that what you said? Yes. It's interesting. Yep. And then um, expert. Yes. Got it. And so, because I'm anticipating the question, it's like, tell us about your ranking and like, what was the journey for you to get to the, what the ranking? And I'm doing this on purpose because I want you to talk about being ahead of the women's division. Before you answer that question though, um, I just want to say again to the people who are watching, thanks for watching. I'm hoping that you're learning a lot about Dr. McCracken and um, I want to invite you guys and uh, I've got it scrolling across the bottom of the screen so I think it's probably self-evident, but um, you are the point, you who are watching, uh, are the point of doing these hangouts that you can be a part of the conversations. Like it's not just me and Tammy, like we could do this by ourselves. You got that? <laughs> right? We, we have, we've done this by ourselves. Yeah. So, but we, we're doing this so that you can be a part of it and you can, like I always say questions, but you know, like if you've got a story, like to share your stories. Like, um, you know, and so you can just do that, writing it in down there um, on, uh, on the Facebook comment section. And uh, I'm watching, I'm, I'm reading there and I'll try to feed them uh, into the conversation. But be a part, be a part, that's the invitation. Okay, now back to you, Tammy. 
uh, okay, uh, progression. Um, for, for you yourself so, and how you got to where you are. All right, so I'm, um, I'm an expert one, which is our 11th rank. If you, you know, if you're counting like the actual numbers of tests or what have you, or patches that you work your way through. And I, and I, um, this gets down really horrible. I, I skipped a few, but what I mean by that is that, is that we have, um, in our system, if you are in, if you go into the instructor development path mm. to become certified as an instructor, you have to pass successfully pass the graduate level one test. And so I would, in the process of working my way up through the practitioner ranks, and we have a like a six month in grade requirement. So you're at least six months between assessments. Um, so working my way up through the practitioner levels, I, at the same time, I was in the instructor track. So they sort of overlaid. Yeah, got it. And so when I took my graduate level one test, the natural progression is I would be a P5 testing for G1, only I was not. I was a little further down because of that six month progression versus right. the process of being an instructor. Um, and it was, uh, it was, it was a fantastic journey. Talk about those, you know, a friend of mine says, um, push at the edges of your envelope hard enough that the envelope changes shape. And that's definitely what my experience was. I started training mostly because at the time I uh, didn't have anything, a whole lot to do with my time. We just moved and I'm, I'm not very good at the stay at home mom thing. I cannot so. imagine you at that. No. <laughs> so, um, so I started training with no intention of continuing. I, I started, I had joined a group practice in the DC metro area that wasn't open yet. And they were, you know, developing building walls, that kind of thing. And so I had this downtime and I was like, all right, I'll, I'll train until the practice gets open. And then, yeah, you know, shift mm -hmm. back. So by the time the practice got open, every, everything had done a 180. I was like, went back to the practice manager and went, so about that whole like full time thing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Not going to happen. Um, Cause it was just uh, the discovery of, of capacity of, of ability like hey this i can actually learn this and then like i might actually be halfway decent at this and then getting super excited about watching you know the shrink in me just never quite goes away so watching other people around me on the mat as a student and watching their personal transformation as well i was like wow i i i have to be a part of this it was almost a, like a compulsion versus a choice. So, um, and I think probably the, the biggest like personal leaps were in the instructor development course because it's it's a very rigorous process. And I got into it probably earlier than I should have as far as like skill levels. So there was a lot of drinking from the fire hose kind mm -hmm. of experience. Uh, the only female in um, one of the, the courses which, you know, really tested my, you know, paradigm as well. So uh, very challenging process uh, at several points along the way. Absolutely never in a million years, even when I decided I wanted to be an instructor, would have ever expected I would be capable of passing our expert one test, ever. So and if, I, if I remember correctly, you were the first woman in America to pass the expert one test. Not not in the U.S. Um, on the East Coast. On the East Coast. The, yeah, yeah, we have. Um, there are two women in our system who who pass that expert test in the U.S. Uh, ahead of me, and there are people I consider mentors. They're fantastic practitioners, um, and but on the the East Coast, uh, west of the Mississippi is or east of the Mississippi. I was I was the first certified female instructor and. Um, and then the first one to pass the E1 test. Wow. So in case I'm speaking for the entire Facebook community, when I say congratulations, then, then you're awesome. <laughs> okay. Your turn to ask me a question. So I was actually thinking about this earlier. I was super curious about how you got into Tai Chi in the first place. Ah, 
So, all right, so that's a story I've told a lot. I'll, I'll see if I can shorten it down a little bit. Otherwise, you know me, I will go off and make a five minute story a half an hour if it's at all possible. So the, you have to understand the context. So I grew up as a very unathletic, I mean, I am voted out of every school I've ever been to least likely to be a martial artist or you know, famous athlete in the history of anybody. Uh, I had severe asthma, like I, like, like I run five miles a day now. And um, when I was a kid, running 50 feet would have me stop and go, ah! so, you know, I was never, so that was my context until my 20s, until I'm in college. And I had gotten out of, I had been in the military, I'd been in the Navy, and I was getting out of the Navy and going back to college. And I'm like, I feel stupid. My brain has stopped working. I need to like reawaken my brain. And I go, I know, I'll learn to meditate. <clears throat> and so I got a book on meditation. I sat down and I tried to do all the exercises on meditation and it was impossible. Like I could not sit still, could not like quiet my mind, like all this meditation. So then I go back and I reread the book and there's a chapter on moving meditation. And it says yoga or Tai Chi. And I'm like, Ooh, that sounds a little Kwai Chen Kane there. Let me just check that out. And so I, um, and, and this, is, this is looking back, like Schopenhauer says, you, you look back upon your life and you see the, the perfect nature of the life story, but you don't really have that perspective until you die. So, but looking backwards now, I'm living in San Francisco. Like at, in, in the late 70s, there is probably no place else in the country where the opportunities existed for me to have this experience that I, I fell into. So there's a class offered at the university in Tai Chi taught by one of the great masters of Tai Chi in the US at that time who was teaching to non-Chinese. And so I took this class and I am still that kid who can't like bend over and touch his toes. I am still like, Ooh. and about 10 minutes into the class, I have a, a religious conversion experience. I mean, the, the heavens parted and lightning struck me. And um, I had a whole series, a whole uh, um, cascade of physical reactions. And suddenly I was moving inside this body differently than I'd ever moved in my life. And I'm like, what is happening? And then it went away as many of these transformative experiences do. And then I spent the next, and I'm like, I've got to, I've got to follow this up. Like, this is just too incredible. And the rest is history. Like, it, like since that, that day 40 years ago, I have never stopped and never not done Tai Chi. That's fantastic. That, that's how it happened. Yeah, that's really cool. And, um, and I think, you know, it, it, does have so many of the, I want to be a priest and tell jokes too. So, so many opportunities <laughs> for that. That's, that's how I living my childhood fantasy. All right, so here's, um, oh, here's a good one. So, uh, actually, there's a couple of really, really good ones. Uh, there was one that's really, really deep. I'm going to save that one. Okay. Uh, but here's another one. It says, what recommendation can you give plus-size people with some physical limits who want to learn martial arts? Uh, so, re I'm sorry, read the question again. Plus-size, recommendations for plus-size people with some physical limits uh, who want to learn martial arts. She says karate, but I'm just going to make it. <laughs> she meant Krav. She meant Krav. Of course she does. It was, it was an <laughs> autocorrect. It said karate. Um, so uh, the first thing is is just how you talk to yourself about it like the there's self-limiting conversation sorry again here's the shrink it just doesn't turn off very well um there's a self-limiting conversation just in how you're presenting yourself um the author of the question and to be open to that not being true it, it you know maybe is true or feels incredibly true right now um, so that I would start it, internally, I would start there and then explore, give yourself mm. the freedom to explore, start out. If you want to start out online, YouTube is like, has an abundance of 
things that you can watch from all different kinds of, you know, martial arts and training approaches. The down, the risk to that is that you're going to watch somebody who's incredibly proficient and jacked and strong and, and go, Ooh, I'm intimidated. I can't do that. Um, but explore and then, and then explore physically. And I would say do that sooner than later, go show up to some different places, take some trial classes and, you know, um, for any instructors or school owners who are hearing this, you're, you're, if you're offended about what I'm going to say next, oh well, um, it's part of an industry. There's a natural tendency to want to sell the new student. You know, join, join us, join us, join us. You know, sign on the dotted line. Um, resist that and just let yourself go explore and take a trial class here, take a trial class there, and wait for you know, like play with it in your body and yeah. go, wow, oh, this is kind of cool. I like this. Or I like this tribe of people because sometimes it's, it'll be more about the tribe at that particular dojo, maybe than the art itself that speaks to you. Awesome. Do that. That's very true. I love that. Yeah. So, so Jenny asked this question, Jenny, you know, like the idea of, um, of exploration as Tammy talks about it, it like, you wouldn't buy a car. You walk into the first dealership and go, and then somebody says, hey, you should buy this car. I'm like, okay, sure, here's my money. You'd be like, no, I want to test drive this one, and then there's a red one I want to try, and I'm going to go across the street and try that, right? So yep. taking on your martial arts, um, same kind of, and I th I, I'm, I'm, I'll ask this as a question. So I'll set it up as a softball. Like, I'm sure you would agree with me that Nice. It's really less about the style than it is about the connection that you make with your tribe and your instructor. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the community of people that you train with is um, essential for the personal journey that you want to take. And it, you may, you know, if we put two dojos right beside each other, or two training centers right beside each other, um, and they're both uh, karate, let's say, for example, one of them will resonate with you and the other one, not so much. Um, go with that because it, at the end of it, it's that sense, it, it's, if you don't feel, so we have a handwritten sign on the wall over our um, water fountains that, you know, our commitment is to be an emotionally safe place or psychologically safe place to do physically dangerous things and that we're a physically safe place to do psychologically or emotionally dangerous things. And that's essential. So if, and if for whatever reason you're someplace and it just doesn't click and this doesn't feel safe on both levels mm -hmm. or one, one of the two, then, and, but the place next door does, and it's not necessarily the martial art you thought you were going to play in. Mm -hmm. um, I would definitely encourage you to stay and play there for a while. And, be in that place that creates that opportunity for you to press it your the edges of your own envelope. So I um, was thinking about this, and then um, Karen Karen Lewandowski on Facebook here made a comment, and I just so this works out perfect timing. So I've been talking, you know, I, I played you up as I said as the most dangerous therapist on the planet, and we talked a little bit about some mindset things and some personal history things, but we haven't really talked about specifically like how badass you are as a, as a fighter and as a self-defense coach. <clears throat> and then Karen said, just watch Tammy's portion of the great courses martial arts. Wow, everyone, everyone, and I'm, that's a, all caps, everyone uh, should watch this or buy it for your daughters for Christmas. Wow. Like, like Karen, A, you are absolutely right on the money. Like, um, um, I, you know, we have had a chance to work together and, you know, she's a real person, so I call her Tammy. But I have this, uh, this level of respect for her, so I call her Dr. McCracken a lot because, you know, like she has real talent for teaching and real technical skill in the specific art that she's teaching. And I wish that everybody could have a chance. Like, you can w go on and, and watch the previews for free. There's a, we're we'll putting a link to this. Um, uh, down in the comment section so you can go and watch that. You get a little chance to see that she... So we've got two um, of her students who came 
um, husband and wife team, both of which are tall, strong people, like bigger than me. And uh, she, like, no, no BS, takes them down with a pinky, right? So um, you, you really, um, I think you'd really enjoy going to see some of, of what uh, Tammy's got. Also, you've got a website because you have a school in the Washington, D.C. area. And do you guys have some videos on there of stuff that you do? Um, not, the website is, you know, pretty sort of boring classic website. Um, the Facebook page is where we put more gotcha. live feed and stuff like that. So, it's so we'll Facebook. make sure that your Facebook page link goes on to the comment sections. You know, we'll, we'll, so guys who are watching now come back and make sure that you watch some of these parts again. And, and also um, there will be people who watch the recorded version of this later on because they couldn't make it because I don't know, they have jobs or some stupid thing like that. Um, Silly. Yeah. So um, you'll follow up and go see uh, the stuff that is happening there at her school. And tell us a little bit about your school. Uh, we've got about five minutes left, and, and I just want to make sure we talk about you and where people can find you. And especially if you live on the East Coast or if you, if you live in the D.C. area or if you have friends or family who live in the D.C. area, this is somebody that you should go check out. So we are actually located in eastern Loudoun County. Um, we're about 30 miles due west of the district and which if you live in this area you know that that could be 40 minutes or two hours <laughs> of the traffic. Yes. Um, so uh we've that, that's actually where i'm at uh, for our conversation i'm at the gym and we have a pretty robust training schedule i have the, the two students they're actually two people who have um, grown up through Krav in the school, and they're now two of my instructors, uh, you know, who did the great courses with us. We have a, um, some fantastic people who decided to go along for the ride and become instructors as well. And um, uh, so we have, a, we have a fun place to play here, pretty robust training schedule. And we are, we are a, fundamentally, we're a self-defense oriented training center. KMG Krav Maga Global's curriculum is about, I would say, 80% of what we do. We're directly affiliated back to those guys. Um, and from a self-defense standpoint, I also do quite a bit of work with Rory Miller and, um, and that the violence dynamics crew. In fact, I get on a plane in two days to go to BC Vancouver to do some teaching up there. And um, so finding us is, is, you know, we're Eastern Loudoun County. Um, if people are in the area, they kind of roughly know where that is. We, and we do seminars from time to time that, mm. you know, we have people that travel in from out of town for, um, so I'm not sure what else you want me to say. So I'll stop there. Here's what I want you to say. I want you to say that you'll come back and do another one of these with me. Okay. Okay. I, I love hanging out with you. You're here. I love hanging out with you too. And and the, like what's going through my mind right now is how many things we have not covered. Like like there's seriously a really like it's a serious question, and I think it's a question that should be asked. It's a question that is is pertinent to the time right here. Um, are you familiar with the hashtag Me Too martial arts uh, meme that's going around right now? Um, so the Me Too martial arts, that's the one I have not seen yet. So this actually. is something that, you know, because I'm in so many martial arts groups or whatever, it's come across my, uh, my notice. Um, but the idea of, you know, sexual harassment and, um, you know, how, like what tools does being a martial artist and be, especially being a Krav in, uh, student as well as an instructor, what tools does that give you to deal with something that is now coming out is like, is a big deal, has always been a big deal. It should be something that we talk about. And you know, I'm like, I've saved it because I, we're having a, other kinds of conversation right now. But I think it is uh, something that I would love to come back and talk about and if I can get you to come back again and talk a little bit yeah. more about KMG and uh, a bunch of stuff like that. So that's what I, that's all I wanted to say. Like, please come back and do this again with us on another one. I, I'd be happy to, this is fun. I always like talking to you, so. Awesome. Well, um, so all of you who are watching um, on Facebook Live right now, and also this is gonna be re replayed on, on our YouTube channel and, and who knows where else it's gonna be. And by the way, now that I'm thinking about all these things, Two things. Number one, all of you who are watching right now should do this. Hit the share button right now and share this 
on your Facebook page or into the groups that you belong to, and so that other people can meet Dr. McCracken as well and get a little sense of this wonderful, wonderful person that she is and just share that, you know, share the love through that. And the other thing is, if you haven't already done so, if maybe this is your first time watching one of the live streams uh, that we do here, and you haven't hit the follow button on Taiji Fit International, all it takes is just like hit the, you know, not just the like, but follow. That way, every time we do another live stream, you'll be notified that we're doing something really cool. And, uh, and we'd love to have you come back and do that. So that's a couple of things that, that you guys can do. Please do come back and watch the next time I have uh, Dr. McCracken on the show because you can tell, like, she's awesome. Right? <laughs> she gets the double A awesome award. My spousal unit would, would uh, caution you about saying that too often. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but we have to step outside. Like my, my partner does the same thing. She'd be like, oh, you, but you don't know him. Like I got, a, yeah. I got this a wonderful message yesterday because I'm posting stuff all the time. Says, David Dorian, you are a wonderful person with a beautiful heart. And then she goes, oh, they don't know you at all. <laughs> but, you know, like there's this other side of it that I'm sure your spousal unit would say, no, nope, you are absolutely right. She is double, double A awesome. So anyway, I got to let you go because we've used up our whole hour. I don't know how that happens. Um, but thank you guys for coming and watching us over there on Facebook. I love you very, very much. And I can't wait to see you again in class or on one of these. And Tammy, thank you so much for giving up your valuable time to do this with me. And, um, and go, go, go check. OK, one last thing, because there's always one more thing. One last thing. So. Dr. McCracken was one of the guest experts on the Martial Arts for Mind and Body program at the Great Courses. She's getting her own program. When do you film? Uh, March. We you film in March. She films in March, with March, which probably means that in 2018, around this time, it'll be available for purchase. So put it on your Christmas list now for next year that you want to get Tammy's program, and maybe next time she comes back, we'll have her talk about that. All right, now I gotta go. Mwah. And I'll see you guys Thanks later. For Thanks for having me. You're welcome. And